This is cereal milk panna cotta, the brilliant invention from the genius mind of Christina Tosi of Milk Bar that launched an empire. It's a brilliant method for turning breakfast cereal into a dessert. You can make it ahead, it's easy to make, it's refreshing and nostalgic. But before we make cereal milk panna cotta, we need to go back and learn what the hell panna cotta is in the first place and how cereal made its way into it now. Panna cotta literally translates into cooked cream. It's one of Italy's most famous desserts. And so this first recipe, we're using straight cream. To make panna cotta, you only need a few ingredients, granulated sugar, heavy cream, salt, vanilla, and powdered gelatin. The only difference between this dish and a pudding is, is that panna cotta uses gelatin to stabilize rather than eggs. So we're gonna need a third cup of sugar, a pinch of salt, one pack of gelatin, which I found out is gonna be a little bit too much gelatin. One pack is three teaspoons. If I were to make it again, I'd only use two, but one pack still works. And then we're gonna whisk the sugar and the gelatin together in a pot, then whisk in two cups cups of cream, making sure that all that sugar and gelatin is mixed in and, and then get that mixture onto the stove on medium heat. I forgot to add the vanilla, so I'm just gonna add about a teaspoon to it now and mix it in and then slowly whisk until the sugar and the gelatin is dissolved and the cream is heated around 140 degrees Fahrenheit and then get it off the heat and then it's time to get the mixture into the molds. I have these stemless wine glasses, which I think are kind of traditional. We're just gonna pour it in there, trying to get nothing on the edges of the rim and then getting it everywhere, of course. Just try and pour it into the center so that nothing gets onto the sides of the glass and then allow that to fully cool. I didn't, I rushed it. I added a cover to it while it was still hot, so it accumulated some condensation. You just want to avoid that. Let it cool completely, cover it, and then get it into the refrigerator for five to six hours or until it's completely set. Then we're going to make a strawberry sauce, which is traditionally served on top of it. And I have a pint of farm fresh strawberries. When you cut into them, this is what a farm fresh in season strawberry should look like, not white. So get yourself some good strawberries at the market. They're in season right now. And we're just going to remove the green part and just give them a cut up. You can throw them into a blender but I'm gonna use a hand mixer, so I'm just gonna use a quart container, throw them in there, a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar just to enhance the sweetness slightly, and then I'm gonna blend this up until it's pureed. I like a raw strawberry sauce because it's gonna bring out that freshness. Then after about five or six hours, the panna cotta should be set. We're just gonna pour that strawberry sauce right on top and then a few sprigs of fresh mint and we've got a traditional classic panna cotta. It's not as jiggly as I would have hoped, although it is nice and creamy. Again, a little bit less gelatin would give more of that little jiggle that I'm looking for. Now, while this is a traditional version of panna cotta, for some, the use of only cream makes it a little bit too rich for them. So the next evolution of panna cotta is experimenting experimenting with different dairies and different proportions. Maybe swapping out cream for half and half or cutting the cream with other dairies like a whole milk. Cream has the highest butterfat percentage, so it yields a very rich product. And now as you go to half and half and whole milk, the butterfat percentage drops. And so I've tried a recipe from Lan Lamb at America's Test Kitchen that uses cream and buttermilk that yields a really interesting product. Buttermilk is actually very low fat, despite what the name might infer. So with the cream and the buttermilk, you're getting rich flavor, but you're also getting a lightness and a silkiness, plus this little tang that adds a complex flavor to it in the end. So this recipe is made in a very similar way to the first, except we're adding buttermilk and the measurements are slightly different and it's gonna give us a very different product. We're gonna go in with a half cup of sugar, then two teaspoons of the gelatin powder, which is one teaspoon less than the first recipe. This is where I actually learned the trick of mixing the gelatin powder into the sugar instead of into the liquid. Then a pinch of salt and mix it all together and then in with the cream, but not the buttermilk yet. There's less butter fat in the buttermilk and it could potentially curdle if we heat it up. So we're gonna hold off on that for now. And then add the vanilla to the cream and then stir it and we're gonna warm it up to that 140 degree temp and then we're gonna let it cool to at least 110 degrees before we mix in two cups of the buttermilk. Once the buttermilk is incorporated, then we can pour them into molds. And now we can start to think of different ways to serving it. We could pour it in a cup like we did the first recipe or we could pour it into ramekins that we can leave into the ramekins or we can unmold later. And then we're gonna allow them to cool cover and refrigerate for at least five to six hours or until they set. But I'm not gonna cover this thin guy because the plastic might ruin that smooth surface. So I'm gonna leave that uncovered. Six hours later, it should be set and nice and jiggly. Now, if you wanna serve uh, one of the panna cottas unmolded, simply take a knife or a pastry tool and just release the panna cotta from the side of the ramekin or jar and then place it in hot water for a few seconds to just slightly melt the sides of the panna cotta so it should just slide right out of the ramekin. And then place a plate over 
it, give it a flip, and then gently allow that panna cotta to just slowly fall out of the ramekin. And it should be really nice and jiggly. Then we're just gonna pour a little bit of that strawberry sauce around the panna cotta, some sliced strawberries on top with a little bit of fresh mint. And we've got a buttermilk panna cotta that is very different than the first. It's beautifully creamy. It's not too firm. It's not too jello-y. It is kind of just right. The texture of this is definitely better than the panna cotta we just made. Somehow using more liquid and less gelatin created this texture that is very silky, almost like it's barely ready to fall apart, but it still stays together. And the slight tang of the buttermilk, it just gives very subtle hints of like a, a little bit of like a yogurt flavor, but it's not like veering too far into yogurt territory. This is really good. We're starting to reach the limits of how you can play with this. Besides different fruit sauces or fresh fruits, we're reaching a wall, but that was until the genius of Christina Tosi wrapped her mind around panna cotta. She's known for being one of the greatest pastry chefs in the world, but having a very low brow taste. She likes American junk food. And when she thought about panna cotta as simply something that's just flavored milk, what's the most iconic flavored milk there is? Cereal milk. What remains in the bowl of cereal after you're done eating all the crunchy bits is a sweetened flavored milk of that cereal. Almost like it's a cereal broth. And that aha moment translated into panna cotta, which then launched an entire empire based around this flavor of cereal milk. And it's quite fun to make and eat. So let's get started. First, we gotta make the cereal milk, which requires about 75 grams of corn flakes, which I measure out on a sheet tray with some parchment paper. And I toast that in a 300 degree Fahrenheit oven for about 20 minutes until it's toasted and fragrant. In the meantime, measure out 675 milliliters of whole milk or two and two thirds cup, 60 grams or one third cup of sugar, and one tablespoon of the gelatin powder, which is one pack. We need the full gelatin powder of that pack to, to thicken the milk, which is a lot less viscous than cream is. Add a pinch of salt and then mix it up. And then about 20 minutes later, you're gonna remove those corn flakes from the oven and add them directly to the milk. Stir it all together and let that sit for about 20 minutes. And just like a tea, that milk's gonna soak up all that cereal flavor. Then you wanna strain it directly into the pot with the sugar and the gelatin. And you wanna push any of that cereal milk flavor out of the cereal back into the pot and discard that cereal then mix it all together add a little bit of vanilla and then get that onto the stove medium heat bring it up to 140 degrees once it hits that temp get it off and then we can begin to fill the molds i want to mimic a cereal bowl here so i'm going to use this little blue bowl and then pour the panna cotta straight and trying to avoid forming bubbles on the surface because those will stay there and be present in the presentation you can also serve it in the molds that you'll release them in later regardless of how you want to serve it you're just going to make sure you just cover them and let them chill for about five to six hours or until they set. Next, we have arguably the best part of this recipe, which is the cereal crunch that goes on top. And now she uses corn flakes, which I'm gonna use as well, but I also forgot I was gonna add some corn pops to the mix of the flavoring of the milk. I forgot I had them. I'm gonna add them to the crunch on top and you can you almost think about how you could play around with this recipe with different cereals you like. Maybe you want a chocolate panna cotta. Maybe you use some cocoa puffs. But since we are using corn flakes, we're gonna follow up with that corn flavor with corn pops, which actually used to be my favorite cereal growing up. So it calls for 85 grams of cereal. I'm just gonna do mostly corn flakes with a little bit of the corn pops to add like a different pop of texture. And then you just wanna break it up like to about a third of its original size. You want some coarse texture. So, you know, so I'm just gonna kinda like a half squeeze. You can go as fine as you want or keep it as coarse as you want. Then add 20 grams or two tablespoons of sugar, 20 grams or two tablespoons of milk powder, which is Tosi's go-to ingredient to amp up depth of flavor in her baked goods. Kind of like MSG for baking. Pinch of salt, then 65 grams or four and a half tablespoons of melted unsalted butter. And mix that all together until the bowl has sucked up any of that dry powder. Then spread that out on a sheet tray, lower the heat in the oven to 275 degrees, and then bake that for 20 minutes until it smells fragrant and buttery. Then you wanna take that out of the oven, let that cool, and then store it in a container in the fridge or freezer for up to a month. But we're gonna use that right away. After about six hours, the panna cotta is set and has a nice jiggle to it. Like I said, I'm gonna use this blue bowl because to me it looks like a bowl of cereal. And on half of that bowl, I'm gonna go in with a generous amount of the cornflake crunch. Next to that, I'm gonna lean a few sliced strawberries onto the crunch, and then I'm gonna garnish it with a really crisp 
green mint leaf. And what you've got is a brilliant way to turn a breakfast cereal into an elegant dessert. This one has a slightly less creamy texture. It's a little bit more like a jello. So immediately you get the flavor of the cornflake infused panna cotta and it's pronounced. And then you get the crunch on top, which makes you feel like you're eating a bowl of cereal. And I used to eat my cornflakes with strawberry. I also put banana in mine and you get a very sort of banana-y texture from the panna cotta. So it is a very nostalgic Nostalgic, familiar flavor that you're getting throughout this whole thing. In terms of the panna cotta, they're all so different and I like them all differently. They're different textures. If you put a little bit of cream in this one, you'd probably get a more creamy texture like the America's Test Kitchen version which was gelatinous, but it was the most creamy version in my opinion. The first needed a little less gelatin. It was a little too firm for my taste. This is the process with which one might develop a recipe. You have to make a breath of different styles to find out what you like in them and how to blend the two. Next time I might try to add a little bit more cream to this. I might try it with the buttermilk and infusing the cornflakes in the buttermilk instead of the cream. You can get really creative and this is how you start to build recipes that are in your style. So to get these recipes, links are gonna be down in the description. That's all that I have today. I'll see you next time. Until then, take care of yourself and go feed yourself. I recently made a pizza for the legendary Wolfgang Puck. If you wanna get the recipe and the story, link to the video is gonna be on screen right now. Thanks for watching.